Well, kia ora and welcome uh, to the Greater Than Solstice Jamboree Campfire Session. Greater Than is a self-managing global collective of practitioners, coaches, product builders, and experimenters in self-management and new ways of working. The Solstice Jamboree is an annual online festival of campfires where the Greater Than team and friends are gathering to experience and look at new perspectives, learn, and inspire. We are in week two of the four week festival and you can see more events on the Greater Than website. Today, we are exploring the TL operating system, scaling decision-making practices at RAISE. I am Michael Elwood Smith and will be your facilitator for today. Before we get started, um, please take a moment to check in in the Zoom chat. Please include your name and organization and any comment you'd like to make to check in. Um, it would be great to hear from you. I would love to have gone around the room, uh, but we have quite a few people uh, who are joining us, which is just amazing. Uh, so I'll just pause for a minute or so while you do um, a check. Hello, welcome. I think um, a number of people have just joined. We just asked uh, if you might just say your name and um, check in. I'm Michael Elwood-Smith um, from... Uh, Lumio, and I've just given a bit of an intro to the uh, the Jamboree and Greater Than Annual Solstice event, um, and welcoming you to our campfire. Uh, just as a quick intro for me, um, I'm a Greater Than Explorer, uh, which is an opportunity to connect and get to know some amazing people. I've also been working with Lumio over the past decade and a member of the Inspiral Network, so I feel I know many of you already. Uh, we're delighted to have you join our campfire, and in a moment, I'll ask Luth, Tamara, and Sagar to introduce themselves. I'm going to ask them a few questions to get our conversation started. There are a few of us, so we ask that you listen into our conversation and ask any questions that pop up for you in the Zoom chat. I aim to keep the last 20 minutes or so of our time that we're for us to respond to questions. For context, Lumio is an online tool. Uh, to involve people in decisions, offering a safe place to progress discussions to an outcome. We first met Ray's in 2018 when they had transformed to a self-managing company and were looking for a communication software tool to help them with the advice and consent decision practices that they had developed. As a power user of Lumio, the team at Ray's has had a big influence on Lumio product development. And we've worked together to adapt Razor's decision-making practices into Lumio. And we're particularly impressed to see the TL operating system, a flowchart guiding staff to practices that they can use for a range of different situations. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Luth, Tamara, and Sagar of Raze. Luth was part of the original team exploring self-management practices. Sagar lives in India uh, and is on shift right now from the middle of the night. Um, and Tamara is relatively new to Raise, and it will be interesting to hear about her experiences onboarding. Firstly, um, Luth or Tam Tamara, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about um, who you are? Just a quick intro for the three of us, the three of you, and then um, tell us what uh, Raise is about. I can start. I'm Luth. I work in people and culture. Um, Sagar and then Tamara can continue on with what raises. Thanks, Luke. Um, so yeah, raises um a staffing company. It's over 65 years old. Um, it's a family-owned business that's grown to become one of the largest staffing companies in Canada. Um, we do a lot of contingent staffing, um, some specialized temporary recruitment, largely IT and engineering, but other areas as well. And um, yeah, Raise was originally named Ian Martin, but we rebranded to the name Raise last year and adopted like a beautiful yellow as <laughs> our brand color. Yeah, thanks for representing, Luth. <laughs> and um, yeah, we have approximately 450 internal staff and about 4,500 contractors on assignment. And yeah, we're a self-managed company. We use the TLOS and we use Lumio, which is what we're here to talk about today. Thanks, and I'm Sagar. Um, I work with Raze and People and Culture team. And uh, our company works from different geographies, including 
you know, Canada, US, India, Philippines, Ghana, Peru. So we operate from different um, geographies and we are, you know, working collectively towards one purpose, connecting people in meaningful work. Yeah, I think uh, Sagar, so, uh, that uh, connecting people and meaningful work was something that um, really struck uh, struck me when we we met um, uh, with the Martin Group at the time. Um, can you, I guess, tell us how that that purpose um, drove and you know led you to choose and explore self management? Yes. Um... Yeah, connecting people in meaningful work. Um, it, it's we we wanted to have uh, meaningful work for not only our contractors, clients, but for our internal employees as well. So while having a self management, uh, we wanted to prioritize that we work in an environment where we have a, a work and life balance, and we wanted to you know work in an environment where there is no. Uh, you know red or orange you know organization it, it's more about teal which is like self-management when everybody is empowered to take decision with the help of different processes we have in place Luth, anything you would like to add um i think that was a great summary i can give the history of how we ended up as a self-organizing company if that um is part of the question michael but yeah that would be you're great yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, not only did we used to be called the Ian Martin Group, um, but we also operate a number of brands. And in 2014, I was working in a little startup owned by the parent Ian Martin company. And the little startup was called Hirefly and then Fitzy. So all if you've heard any of those names, it's all the same company. Um, and it's not, that's a bit of a soup even for us internally. I was working with this little startup um, owned by the parent company. At the time, there were only six of us. And the COO of the parent company, I think, went to a conference where someone recommended Frederick Laloux's book, Reinventing Organizations. And he thought, this is weird. Those, those Firefly Fitzy people will like it. And lent us, not even the book, I think, at that point, it was like um, a set of CDs, like actual CDs, where Ken Wilber was in, um, interviewing Frederick Walu. And we listened to those, the six of us, we read the longer version of Walu's book, and then literally got in a boardroom and said, like, this is so cool. Like, do we want to do this? Yes. Where do we start? Self-organization or self-management, we would have called it at the time. And um, on February 14th, so Valentine's Day, we call it Valentine's Day 2015, those six people in a boardroom said, decided to give up positional authority, authority, those that had it, and to start building the practices that would eventually come our become our homegrown teal operating system. Um, so we never used a, we never had a, a teacher, a consultant, and outside anything. We never used a system. We never did holacracy or sociocracy or NAIR or any package thing. It was just like we were just um enthusiastic and had Lalu's book and figured it all out from there. And probably the foundational practice that we first adopted was the advice process. And I think this will be is is quite relevant to how we use Lumio. Um, so maybe I'll expand on that later. But the advice process certainly was a very, very foundational element for us. And it took about six months for us to figure out enough practices that I would say we were a self-organizing team. And I remember at the time, my my fantasy job was that some CEO or business owner would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, Luth, can you help me do self-management in my company? But it actually had never occurred to me that it would be the Ian Martin group owner, um, CEO, whose name is Tim. I don't know why I just didn't, <laughs> that didn't occur to me. But eventually he did. Um, the Fitzy business was growing rapidly. Um, we were about 20 people, um, 20 staff. Things were going really well. The business was growing. The people were happy. And I think people were starting to notice that. And although we weren't intending to export our practices to the bigger company, um, when the CEO of the bigger company asked us to do that or asked me to do that, um, it was a very difficult decision. I was sort of, I would say that was the happiest I've ever been in my career on that team. Um, it was a, it was magical. It was like, 
that, you know, that team, if you've ever been on a team that just has that like ability to communicate, to move fast, to challenge one another, it was, it was such a peak experience. Um, but then at the same time, I was pulled by the opportunity of introducing more people to this way of working. And in the end, I said yes, um, and taught the um ended up teaching the practices and leading the transformation of the bigger company which like soccer said or someone said tamara said we're now about 450 people in six main countries um around the world um and and we still use our our homegrown teal operating system um which i'm happy to show or elaborate on but i'll turn it back to michael because i feel like i talked for a long time no, that was wonderful. Uh, great to hear your enthusiasm as well, and and a bold move. Uh, you know, give up positional authority, you know, move into you know, move into this this area, and I guess you know that naturally leads us on to the to the next stage, which is you, a lot of things that uh, decisions that were typically made by managers, you know, suddenly you had to figure out how are you going to do that in a flat organization, um, and and I guess you know. <laughs> from that you've developed a series of decision making practices and and maybe do you want to give an example of what one of those you know might be a typical management decision that suddenly became necessary to to make with your team yeah i i can um explain the two decision making mechanisms that we have and then soccer and i both picked examples from our our live lumio that we can show you an example of each but um, in the early days, we used the advice process where anyone can make any decision provided that they've sought the input of those that have expertise or are impacted by the decision. And although that works really well and is still one of our six foundational common practices in the organization, we started running up against the issue that I'm, I think many of you will be familiar with that um, there were times where a decision maker would try to make a decision that required other people to, to change or do something or implement that decision. And the other people were not accepting of that decision. And it was, it was that frustration. It was that sort of pushing the edges of the advice process that led us to go searching and find consent-based decision-making. So we now have both. Those are the two foundational or really the, the only two decision-making mechanisms that we have um, in the organization. And the difference being in one, it's a single decision maker that makes the final call. In the other, you ask for the group's consent. And our standard for consent-based decisions is that it affects the work or behavior of other people. That This might be a good time to show the teal operating system. Um, which is online. Maybe Sagar can drop the um, the link into the into the chat. Um, but this is our deal operating system that guides every employee to know what to do. So any employee can encounter a problem or opportunity in any part of the organization. This flowchart guides them to through a series of questions. Is it worth pursuing? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. Um, if it is, here's our six common practices that you would use to resolve whatever tension you're experiencing. If it's not, we um, we include this statement around letting it rest. It's okay not to pursue problems, opportunities, but it's not okay to complain that other people are not pursuing them because at any time you can choose to do something about the thing that you see. Um, and then these are our two decision-making practices. Like I said, the advice process, when the impact on other people's work or behavior is not significant, and a consent process when it is and you require their buy-in um, in order to take that decision. So I, while well, I've got my screen open, um, this is our real live Lumio um, dashboard. That's not the view that I thought it would be. I don't know what I've done something wrong. Um, ah, it's because I'm searching the word live hire. Get rid of that. There we go. So these are decisions that are currently um, active in our organization. I This one was just near the top and I'm involved in it. So I will show it as an example of an advice process. We have three employee resource groups in the organization for women, for black people and for LGBTQ plus people. In the women's community, um, one of the stewards, Courtney, had a proposal for how we would um, handle next year, like what meetings we would have in the next year. 
Um, she had gotten a proposal from our facilitators, which was posted here with the costs. And then so the primary audience of this one was the women of the organization and non-binary people who came in here and gave Courtney their feedback on um, what they liked or didn't like or what they wanted to see in the following year. And this was a cool one because the feedback from the um, members was not very consistent with Courtney's original proposal. And I talked to Courtney today and I know that she intends to now like sort of follow the advice and go a different way. Um, but this would be an example for us of an advice process where um, Courtney could make a decision to go with her original proposal um, that she had posted here. Or in this case, she's listened to the feedback of the participants and she's going to go a different direction. So um, pretty simple from a from a process point of view, um, but super helpful from an actual decision-making point of view where, where the decision is not the one that the person intended when they started. And then I'll turn it over to Sagar because I think he's gonna show this one, comp Sagar. I'll uh, say I um, I asked Sagar to come with me today because anytime I, I do an interview or meet somebody or they have questions about raises, operating system always I get the question like but what's it like in India because that's our most I think we have 300 um, people in India so it's our most significant population and at some point I just got tired of like giving people my perspective of what it, of what the how the teal operating system works in India and I'm like let's hear from somebody that actually you know lives that every day so I'm now uh you will now see Sagar with me whenever I do these things Yes, sure. Uh, as Luth mentioned, uh, that consent process is something that impacts the work and behavior of others or a larger people. So that's why this is a consent process. So recently, uh, there was an idea that we wanted to check if the compensation, we have different processes in uh, our teal operating system, including a compensation advice process. So wanted to test out if a compensation advice process will work for India, or we wanted to continue with our annual review process that that happens every August. So this was the idea which was, uh, you know, shared with a larger group. I mean, like whole company. And uh, Luth, if you can scroll down, uh, after sharing the idea, I'm like, people started sharing. I have given the discovery, what I've, you know, got from that, uh, you know, idea. And now people started reacting to the, you know, idea. And after, you know, everybody started sharing, uh, okay, why they agree, why they disagree, and what changes they want to make in this proposal. Um, as a reviewer, I had to, you know, analyze all the feedbacks, connect with them, and then make a proposal. So this is a live one, which is um, currently at proposal stage. After reviewing everything, then I have made a proposal today. And uh, it is, again, I'm like sent to all company for a consent. Now the process, as per process, I'm like right now. I'm like I have to wait for three days to you know get the consent, and after you know if nobody objects to this proposal and feels this is not a backward movement of the company, and feel this is a good idea, then people will share a consent and we will implement this process. That's that's example of one consent process. Also, I would like to share one more. Uh, that that's a role advice process. How do we change roles in an organization which is um, a self-managed organization and we don't have bosses we don't have person with positional authority who comes and tell me okay Sagar I'm like this is your new title or this is your new role so what do we do I'm like so I uh, shared uh, kind of my self-assessment um, that okay I, I was doing a role and I'm looking for a change and now I'm like this are my strengths these are my weaknesses and uh, what what I'm expecting from my advisor and now after you know reading all these things now i you know in the lumio uh, people started reacting what i should take and start doing and they have set off you know expectation from me and what i should take as my new role and accountability and then i uh, you know kind of again i'm like go back review all the you know one on one discussions review all the suggestions and feedback that i've received and propose uh, what should be my new role and once people consent to it, then I I have implemented my new role and then shared the outcome with all company that, okay, I'm like, with everybody's advice, this is my new role and this is my new roles and responsibilities. That's how this is one more way of decision-making, how you know we change roles in our organization. 
Uh, that that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. That's um, astounding, actually, to see how many people are engaged as well <laughs> uh, in in the process. And uh, yeah, truly amazing. Um, the what struck me as well is about the TL operating system. Both of these, the role advice process and the compensation advice process, are are examples of, I guess, you know. Well, not non-traditional ways of making decisions in your organization. Uh, I know that there's been a few others that have been developed, like consent to hire and so forth. Uh, it'd be interesting just to, if you could just show briefly how the TL operating system also is a link into the documentation that you have developed that will help people to provide a consistent way of, of um, following those processes or starting them? I can take that. Lindley and I can take that. Um, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yes. So, so I'm going back to our, our basic TL operating system and we've, Sagar and I have essentially showed examples of what's in the yellow box. So the decision-making part of the world. In this TL, um, in these TL boxes in the middle are practices related to roles um, as well as contribution. And Sagar has showed you an example of his last role advice process where he switched from recruiting management to people and culture. And then we have our other two, com we call these the six common practices. The other two relate to um, behavioral and interpersonal conflict, feedback, facilitation. So those are the six practices that we would consider like anybody might need to use on a daily basis. So very, um, very common practices. Whereas at the side here under people practices is what, what in an orange organization or a green one would be more your HR stuff. How do I hire? How, how do I get consent to hire? Then how do I hire? How do I sponsor? That's what we call onboarding or induction. How do I sponsor the new person? Um, work adjustment is if you need to change your hours. Like I recently became a part-time um, employee using that practice. Compensation advice process is how we set our salaries. Um, so yeah, all those more HR things um, are available to any coworker. We just sort of lump them at the side as not, not our core core practices, um, but our people practices. And yes, if you click through um, any of them, like there will be a template and there will be a list of um, the people that can help you to, you know, we call them peer mentors, the people who have more expertise in this practice that could help you um, if you get stuck or if you're confused or you need somebody to talk it through, the template that you would fill out. Um, and yeah, and then, but the actual work you would do in Lumio. I won't show you an, a compensation advice process because I don't have anyone's permission to do that, but very similar to what Sagar showed, um, only to do with compensation and not consent-based. So at the end, you wouldn't see a poll, you would just see the person making their final decision. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you, Liz um, and Sagar for sharing that. Uh, I see there's a question just um, popped up uh, from Itmar about uh, business practices as well. Uh, yeah, curious about business practices yeah. as well. For example, what would it take to engage with a new client or a new vendor? Uh, do you have those sorts of decisions that are that have taken place? I think that one is less addressed through Teal. Um, I'm on the team that helps to write the bids, like proposals for new business. Um, but I think there are lots of other business related decisions that do go through Teal. Um, I think largely ones like the, the proposal that Luz showed about whether to acquire live hire, I think because that had a big impact on the, you know, company's finances. I think that was one that um, did go through Teal. I think um, I suspect that perhaps around the um, like new work type, type, um, processes I'm wondering whether yeah I don't know I find myself wondering whether because there is often a type tight timeline to write and submit bids it's just like let's go for the business maybe if there was for some reason something controversial about a particular line of work then I think at that point it would become something that we would address through teal if if 
there was kind of an understanding that there might be like a lot of different feelings or perspectives around that work. That's just my um, impulse or my first thought as someone like relatively new and still learning to use teal. But I don't know, Luth and Sagar, would you say that's right more or less or are there other insights you can add there? I would point to this, the same practices of a, advice and consent and Tamara's right, probably the writing of the proposal um, is urgent and just gets done. But then the distribution of that work would be a consent based, like, does this team want it or that team wants it? And, th and those can be very contentious moments um, because some clients are more attractive than others, um, especially to recruiters. Recruiters are have quite strong opinions about what kind of candidates they want to recruit and for whom and whether that's good work for those candidates or not. There were some, and talking with some other members of the race team, uh, I've heard of some big decisions that have been made in the company about shifting to a new CRM uh, system or, or core uh, system and, and you know, how, how the organization responded during COVID uh, times, you know, with the, with a drop in in income from traditional work and and having to switch to to something else, so that really intrigued me as well to hear you know how in moments of I guess crisis or big decisions you had the culture and the practices in place to be able to call on people uh, and that they had the um, I guess the the enthusiasm and permission and 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 confidence to be able to step up and and suggest ideas. Luth, do you want to describe any any of those um, points? Yeah, it, it um, when I was first teaching people at Ray's about um, consent based decision making and all of this stuff, I remember one of the the questions that the executives would ask me all the time was, "Yeah, but what if the employees want to change the applicant tracking system?" For us, that's like our CRM. It is the most important software that a recruiting company uses. It's where all our client information is, all our candidate information, every call, we everything is tracked in this applicant tracking system. And at the time we had a commercial product from the US um, that was good, but the executives were like terrified that some person, Sagar, Tamara, Luth, would like decide to switch applicant tracking systems. And sure enough, uh, about two years ago, someone decided it was time to switch applicant tracking systems and they just did it in Lumio the way that I, I think I have that one open, so I'll share my screen again. Uh, I think that's the right tab. I opened that one up. Nope, that's the wrong. Well, I think I've accidentally navigated away from it. But here it was, so April 2020, and it was actually the owner of the organization who initiated the Lumio um, to replace Bullhorn, the applicant tracking system that we had at the time, with a product from Australia called LiveHire. And so we, we would say this is the largest um, consent process we ever did because it's such a fundamental change for our business to, to change applicant tracking systems. It affects everybody, every recruiter, every IT person, marketing, everybody is affected sales by this kind of decision. And so you'll see Tim's, um, this is his post explaining why and the pros and cons of one tool and the other. And um, then I won't or you with the nitty gritty, but there is a lot of discussion in this thread from recruiters asking about features to people organizing um, demos. So, okay, I still have questions. Can we do another demo with the product team and ask more questions? Um, Jebus is our colleague from recruiting. So he has really specific, oops, I navigated away from it, but very specific, um, you know, opinions about the features of the tool. So all of this is documented in here, which is a huge advantage for us of Lumio is, I'm sure Jevis doesn't remember what he said about this decision, but if he ever needed to, he can go back and, and um, say it. To Tim making the proposal on the 26th of April, it passed with um, just over a hundred people participating. And um, and so that that all is there and documented, which is incredibly useful. This decision actually didn't turn out to achieve the things that we thought it would achieve at the time. 
So it's also super helpful to go back to something and look at what your assumptions were um, and why you thought this was going to be a great change. So not every decision is always, I, I recently um, met someone that I would consider, you know, very, a very advanced practitioner of self-management and teal who I was describing to them um, something that had not gone well. And they were really shocked, like didn't collective intelligence, you know, prevent that from happening. And I don't know, my experience is that we still sometimes make bad decisions um, or decisions that don't pan out the way that we thought that they would. Uh, but we have this at least way of um, learning from that by going back and looking at how we ended up there. So just to be really vulnerable that like not every single decision we take is amazing just because we used collective intelligence. And I lost track of this. I think, Michael, there were two parts to your question, but that's the that's the part about changing our CRM and what a huge decision it was for us. Yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. And uh, one of the areas I was interested to explore with you as part of the tail operating system, uh, you also have some foundational practices that or and skills that are are that you encourage your know, staff to to develop. And I guess this is a, a good segue for Tamara for a second that, you know, I, I was interested um, as somebody relatively new to E.M. Martin Group, how did you find, you know, joining uh, an organization that operates in this way? Uh, what do you like about it? You know, what are you fearful about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I found it really exciting. I had never even heard of self-managed organizations. I wasn't like terribly familiar with the concept, but I think it's honestly incredible. You can really, I think, draw on the expertise of people from within the organization who have like really different roles, really different perspectives. I think it's, you know, you can get such um, a richer range of perspectives that way um, than from sort of like top-down decision-making. Um, I know also there were ways in which I found it kind of like intimidating or overwhelming when I first joined because staffing has like quite a lot of different acronyms. Like there's sort of like acronyms for our technology, acronyms for like, you know, things like ATS, applicant tracking system or um, EOR, employer of record, BPO, business pro process optimization. So many acronyms. And then on top of that, I had all of the TEAL acronyms as well, like hearing about RAPs and WAPs and CRs and and yeah so it was there was a bit of a learning curve there for sure um but yeah I felt like it it was just I think overall my feeling was like enthusiasm and excitement because it it I think it feels really nice to get to feel that everyone's perspective and um insight is valued within the organization it's nice to have the level of transparency that comes with self-management and with teal and um, yeah, I think it it does really give people the chance to feel like their voice is heard and their concerns are addressed. So I, I feel like that's a wonderful element. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tamara. Um, and Luth, the other part of the question that I was interested to explore briefly kind of leads on to one of my last sort of big questions. Does self-management actually and raise, you know, has it helped the company commercially? Has it helped you grow? Has it helped you with retention of staff? Has it helped you uh, grow revenue? And and there was one decision I know of a, a couple of years back with that uh, COVID time uh, where where you had to switch gears uh, a little bit, and and that you know had quite a, a financial impact um, on the company. But uh, yeah, without saying any more. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, can you tell us about that? Sure, yes. And that was the other part of your question that I had lost track of. But um, when COVID started March 2020, it dramatically and negatively impacted our industry and our business. Our job order volume, which for us would be an important metric, dropped in half. So we had half as much customer job orders to work on as we had had before, which for us was like a that is an untenable situation where the company, you know, really was facing catastrophic um, ends. And very quickly, people self-organized, rallied, two women, one from sales and one from compliance, like, which I don't even know how they got connected with each other. They, they used Lumio to make a proposal 
to drop everything that had been a, you know, strategic on the strategic agenda. And instead, um, their theme was pivot, like pivot away from these industries, our traditional customer industries that we're not hiring and find other organizations that we can help. And that decision and the way that people rallied around it led us to take on what ended up being the largest contracts we've ever had in the company's history. And as Tamara said, um, the uh, company was founded in 1957. So it's a pretty old company, biggest projects we've ever done were as a result of those two women saying like, drop everything, pivot, let's find new stuff to do. They were these major um, public healthcare contracts in Canada that not, not only like saved us, but caused us to double in size. So we were about 250 people before um, COVID and we're about 430 now because of the growth that we experienced right after COVID. So we went from like flat to like dying to like dying of overwork. Um, that's leveled off now again, but the two years, probably 21, 2021, 2022 were the most profitable in the company's history by a, by like 650% um, factor. So like our, our business results since doing this transformation are dramatically different than they were before. We were flat for at least the time. I've been here 11, 12 years and we were flat for most of the time. So, so profitable and like sustainable, but flat for a decade prior to the transformation to self-organization. Um, and that led us to implement profit sharing and to share very generously the profits of the company with our employees in all regions and all parts of the world. Um, and I think um, my colleague Edwin, Edwin and I did a um, podcast with Lisa, who I saw here somewhere on this topic. So um, for the full, for the gory details of the COVID story, leader morphosis. Yeah, that's a great resource. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lisa, <laughs> uh, for that being so helpful. And um, and I think, you know, I, I just say a, a couple of words as well that um, from our perspective at Lumio, we have been so thrilled and excited to see this development of work practices uh, and, and decision practices and the importance of those uh, that... Um, We've been recently working to build in proposal templates where you can actually develop and document your own practices um, within Lumio and, and link that into your to your handbook. And I, I see there's a handbook has just popped up um, uh, as well in the chat link uh, from um, from Lisa too. So thank you. Uh, the origin of that. So we have um, around 19 minutes or so um, left, and I just wanted to open it for some other questions uh, from you all. I'm sure you've got a few burning questions. Um, there are uh, 27 of us um, online right now. So uh, I think it's okay actually just to um, raise your hand if you've got a question uh, and, um, and it'd be great to hear from you. Um, Lisa, please unmute and ask. Hi, thank you for this. I'm I'm such a hardcore fan of both Rays and Lumio, so this is really great. Um, I at the risk of of you being bored of answering this question, I am really curious to know about your experience in India. <laughs> so I'd love to hear from you, Saga, and and the others because I hear from lots of organizations, both Indian organizations and international organizations that have like a you know part of their organization in India that there's, it seems like there's often like a set of unique challenges in terms of adopting self-management. So I'm, yeah, I'd love to hear like, you know, what were the challenges, what worked, what didn't work in terms of uh, kind of adopting Teal in, in India. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so when, when we started uh, uh, adopting Teal practices, uh, the first challenge is, uh, okay, there are no managers. I'm like, no positional authority. I mean, that was the first ch challenge where people felt, I'm like, you'll not be guided. Um, but again, I'm like, started working with uh, the operating system more and more. People realized, no, the roles and responsibilities still 
exist. It's just the positional authority. You are empowered to take decision rather than somebody sitting on closed door or you know sitting on the positional authority taking the decision. So uh, initially, I would say I'm like anybody. I'm like even when we were interviewing people, they were like, uh, "Okay." I'm like, "Is it real?" I'm like, "You don't have managers." I'm like, "No." I'm like, "No." I'm like, "We do have managers for the work, but not to take decision on behalf of you." So there, the, these are the things, and then. Uh, obviously, I'm like, big part is voice. We are still working on that. I'm like in India. Uh, so in self-management, one thing is even if you take a decision, uh, rather it's consent process or advice process, there is uh, people are required to, you know, share their opinion and voice. We struggle a bit. I'm like with that. and But I'm like over time, I'm like people are becoming more familiar they are you know sharing their views openly and uh, we believe in one concept that's psychological safety which is like more of trust uh, so once people started having trust in you and the process uh, they realized the power is not in the hand of people power is in the hand of process i'm like so uh, anybody is empowered to take any decision here anybody is uh, you know can treat themselves as co-owner of the company and then take any decision. So basically I'm like, it was challenging initially. I'm like, how I'm like, we have transitioned from a green organization to a teal organization or a self-managed organization. But over time, I'm like, we started working. Um, we started connecting with other companies as well. Uh, recent, uh, recently, when we talked to our colleagues, I'm like, um, uh, and you know, ex colleagues from other companies, they are um, also very interested to know how we operate and how how this works. Thank you, thank you, Saga. Um, there's also a question from Daniel about six hats uh, in the chat, and uh, so yeah, we've been talking a lot about teal and green and blue and so forth. So um, maybe. Uh, Daniel, do you want to just um, ask your question? Uh, say hi and yeah, good day. Um, so I know there's certain uh, combinations of the six hats uh, for certain decisions. Um, just wanted to know whether that was actually used. Yeah. Yes, um, I teach six hats even long before I had ever heard of self management and teal and all this stuff. I um, was using and teaching six hats. I think it's a brilliant tool. And I teach it to in our sponsorship program to everybody that joins the organization. So that if you go to a meeting and somebody says, what's the yellow hat? You'll at least know what that means. Um, and then it's up to teams how they use that tool or any of our equal talking time tools. But Sakra and I are on the same team and we made a decision. It was two weeks ago, I think um, we set a strategic goal for the year using a prescribed six hats like um sequence so yes we use them both casually as like hey what's the black hat on this decision and sequentially in more or organized meetings um, same as we use liberating structures and lots of other tools that would be familiar i think to most people on this call cool cool thanks 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 Ruth. um Tina, I see you have your uh, hand raised. Um, please ask. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, thanks from my side. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, my question concerns how inclusive the whole process is. So I see there are many opportunities to contribute or to yeah make a decision, to say your opinion. But I mean, do, does everyone, everyone have the ability to contribute according to your experience? Or do some people... Do some people need more empowerment than others probably and how can you um yeah make that possible um yeah that's what i would be really interested that's such a good question i i can start and then tamara and sagra can give their perspective most of our decisions are posted publicly and people are encouraged to go in like if this topic interests you go in there and say what you have to say and we do a lot actually to teach that behavior and encourage it. But just, just because that is available doesn't mean that everybody feels the same level of comfort to participate. And I think we're keenly aware of the impact of people's cultures, of their race, of their sexuality, of their gender. 
just just because the Lumio is there doesn't mean that everybody feels the same um, ability to approach to dissent. Um, so I think it's I think that's a real opportunity, um, growing edge for us and for others using you know trying this stuff. And if you um, Tina, if you know how to do that, please please message us and teach us how. Uh, maybe just to react directly, I was wondering whether you also have anonymous discussions or where one can yeah, vote anonymously, but I guess that's not available for reasons. We we do have some, um, we have our all company kind of town hall meeting where we use anonymous tools to crowdsource ideas and vote on them. And so we don't, we use some anonymous practices, but I would say we have a bias for the opposite for like, what is the opposite of anonymous named <laughs> contribution? And we might not have that balance right. We we might need to explore more using anonymous tools so that even in the decision that I showed in Sagar, I don't, you might want to elaborate on this. Sagar's compensation decision is extremely contentious. It had to do with deferring annual increases in India, which are a big deal for six months, which was Sagar's initial proposal, right? Like that's what you initially plan to do. And it really got a lot of people's like knickers in a twist. And so um, a lot of people weren't comfortable going into Stogger's thread and saying that so publicly, because then it's it, also it's about money. So it's like, if I disagree with this, it's going to seem like I'm a greedy bastard. And, you know, that's a very uncomfortable dissent. So a lot of people had their other people post for them. Um, where it's like, I was talking to my friend today and they said, so people find ways to stay anonymous, but I think we could, we could do a lot, a lot more. Yeah. And we do also have surveys that are anonymous. Um, and yeah, perhaps we should do them more frequently or on a wider range of issues. I guess it's always tricky to balance it because, you know, then also quite a bit of work needs to go into like thinking about survey questions, analyzing the data. Sometimes it can be hard to gather more info if, it's not clear who holds a particular perspective. You don't know who to follow up with. And so I think um, that's part of what's nice about the transparency of a Lumio post. And also that said, as Luth was saying, not everyone does feel comfortable. So actually Sagar had sent a message where he sort of summarized the comments that he, he had received directly that were not posted company-wide. And he said, here's like, a range of comments uh, that have been shared with me and I wanted to share them. And, you know, he's the public face of those comments, but they've been shared with him by people who just didn't necessarily want to like share in front of the entire company. So I think, um, you know, there can be some workarounds around some of these issues of transparency and how comfortable people feel. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's something we're always like refining and looking to improve. Totally. I, I would like to add one thing. I'm like, apart from that, we have a set of facilitators, trained facilitators in the company where people can go and seek for advice on like how they would like to, you know, draft the proposal if they're not comfortable enough in, you know, drafting the, uh, you know, comments or feedback or suggestions. So that's option is also available where people, there are a set of people who are trained and can help people to uh, draft their feelings well. One one other point that may may or may not be um, be clear is that not not all of your decisions are made with all of the people all the time, right? So that those processes you have uh, the structure you're calling on particular advisors and you're using not um, it's not always all company. Uh, you have you know I noticed that there were a number of different subgroups or groups uh, in 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 there, and you have invite only threads as well. I saw one of them. Um, where you're just inviting specific people in to have a discussion or advice process around that specific thing. So I think that's, yeah, it's not chaos, right? <laughs> no, and it's also used often in conjunction with teams, like all company on teams. So a lot of the time someone might say like, I'm doing a, a role advice process, like here are my advisors, here's my peer mentor. Um, if you wish to be involved or you have material advice for me, please let me know, I'll add you to the thread. And then that way too, it sort of 
I think there's so much going on within a company at any given time. And um, so it kind of both keeps it maybe managed, kind of contained to the people that it will most directly impact, but it also gives people the freedom and the opportunity to be more involved if they wish to be by just kind of announcing that this is happening and saying to let me know if you'd like to be involved. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Phil, uh, you have your hand, hand raised. Um, <laughs> thanks for your patience. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, it's very nice to hear this um, and to see some of it too. Um, my main question is what happens if um, there's zero feedback to something raised? There's, there's zero consent or opposition or anything. So can you just then go ahead and decide about your salary yourself ultimately? Or like, what is the solution there? That's a great question I've never had before. I, I can't think of a time where someone tried to do something and had no advice. Okay. Um, I think the principle would be if, you know, if I posted something publicly and people had a fair chance to see it and weigh in on it and just nobody cared, then I could just go ahead and do whatever, whatever I want. It's prob probably was an immaterial decision. Like, and that's yeah. why nobody said anything. Okay, cool. Yeah, Thank you very much. Either. But, and I think for the, you know, something like compensation or role, something that will like affect the company and affect um, colleagues, there would be advisors and a mentor. So people would have to weigh in, but it is a good question. <laughs> Thank you. And Christabel, you, you have your hand raised as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm loving these questions and all of this. Uh, I've mostly uh, practiced sort of like kind of autonomous self-management organizing in like a grassroots setting. And I'm curious, like we often run into an issue where people I think don't believe that they can make proposals or they don't, don't believe that, that they can like have a say. And I'm like I've often theorized that like, oh, it's because we're not doing it enough because at work you have a boss or at work, these other situations, all of your other situations are hierarchical. And then for five or 20 hours a week, you're not. I was curious, like when you have people, do you have any, do you ever have part-time workers or, and, and does it take them longer to like incorporate into the system? Or when you have new hires, like, like how easy is it for people to believe? Or I think I heard in one in you, some of your responses that some people still don't engage. That, that maybe they've been around for a while and they still don't act as though their voice matters. Like, how do we get people to really internalize that their voice matters? You know, it's one way is to make bad decisions. <laughs> Um, that one I was showing about the applicant tracking system was, was the best decision that the people involved at the time were able to make. And yet I suspect there were a bunch of people hiding who had dissenting voices, but, but were afraid to just, particularly that was the owner and CEO leading that proposal. Now in retrospect, they can say that wasn't a good decision. We should have spoken up. And that does happen. And I, I actually think it's one of the more motivating realities of decision making is that we do get it wrong sometimes and that increases the responsibility on the folks with the dissenting voices to speak up the next time like <laughs> please stop us from doing the wrong decision the next time and I think our also our, like our scarier people our more senior more experienced people have to work at getting bent. I was typing up a proposal that I'm going to put up next week this morning and at the end as a joke, I was like, please, you know, give me your questions, your improvements, dissenting voices get ice cream. Like, and it's not true, but just just making it like, I don't know, doing doing whatever you can to say, I really do want dissent. Um, I really do want someone to tell me if I'm about to fall off a cliff. Yeah, I, I would um maybe just add to that. That's a great response. Uh, because um, but what what you're also doing with those practices and uh, that, that you've that you've developed is that you have a more agile way of recognizing and reviewing decisions to to make it better. 
Um, and often the cost of not making a decision is greater than the cost of making a poor decision, even if you have to fix it a little bit down the track. Um, we know that too, uh, you know, as you're, uh, you're iterating and learning uh, from, from what happens. Look, this, is, um, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. I uh, just wanted in the last sort of minute or so to invite um, Tamara and Sigar and um, Luth to just say a couple of closing remarks. Uh, and then when we close um, with this, I, I think I have set up a survey, just a really short optional survey with a couple of questions. Um, just really interested to get your feedback uh, and particularly if you wanted to follow up or learn anything more about anything you've heard today. So uh, uh, with that, um, Tamara, would you like to, to close us? Um, sure. Yeah, I'm still learning a ton about teal processes and starting to become more involved. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Thank you to Michael for inviting me to participate. I also got to learn some things today and it was great. Thank you so much. Uh, Saga? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I would say Teal is a journey and uh, it is ongoing process. So we keep developing, uh, you know, as per the needs and uh, it it's really enjoyable journey. I'm like, I have worked with so many people. I'm like over time and then um, everybody commented Teal. Uh, I mean, they like complimented Teal. Um, as one of the best, uh, you know, decision that we have ever taken. So, yeah, thank you everybody for asking questions and inviting me. Same, and and the one thing I, that I always think when I'm in rooms like this is, as a as a percentage of the global population, those of us that are interested in new ways of working are a teeny tiny minority, and so we have to help one another and being vulnerable and be honest and share tools and and some of the stuff we're doing is great and some of it sucks and like but you can have it all it's all free um on that website or you can find me or Sagar or Tamara or Michael um and ask us questions or collaborate with us so I just really I really think um we can and should all help each other uh on this journey that Sagar talked about yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and thanks for your energy and your participation. Yeah, there are a bunch of resources uh, that, that we're all developing. And um, this is a place where you can begin to, to share them. So do reach out if you have any questions. I uh, look forward to meeting you again, helping you in your practices. And um, the sun is just rising in this part of the world. So we're about to start our day. For those that have joined us from all over the planet, uh, wherever you are, uh, thank you very much and go well. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.